Why don't we give it up for Fred Wayne? <laughs> Good morning. I can be a little loud, so you might want to turn that down a little. I, um, I want to first say I, I am grateful to be home. You know, I want to, got a lot, all the Lord has pressed upon my heart. I believe he has a word for us this morning. I want to start off by uh, just thanking Michael Moore and Beacon Hill um, a little bit of my testimony, I was uh, plugged into a local church uh, for a number of years, um, and some things transpired, and I don't know if anyone in here can relate to this, but have you ever been church hurt? Yeah. You know, and um, you know, there was two men of, of God that the Lord had placed in my life at that moment, and one of them was your pastor. And I just want to thank Michael Moore uh, for coming alongside Fred Weymouth at a time when he needed a man of God in his life. So God used him and another pastor to walk uh, through that time in my life. And there was one thing I was certain of, that I loved the church. I loved the church. I loved the bride of Christ. I loved the people. Um, and I did not understand. You understand, I was walking with the Lord for a few moments, but I was new to the church thing. I wasn't raised in a church. I didn't know church politics. I didn't know all the stuff that went on within the church. And, but I knew that I loved the church. The church had uh, preached the gospel to me. The church had come alongside me, had discipled me um, out of a place of homelessness and heroin addiction. Um, but there was a time in my life where I was like contemplating being a, a cowboy Christian. I was like, I can do this on my own. I, I don't like being hurt. I don't like being around people. Um, I'm just going to go out in the street and I'm going to do this thing on my own. Um, and that's not the way we're called to do this. Uh, we're, we're called to be in community and be uh, a part of the body of Christ in the local church. Uh, secondly, I will tell you, I wrestled all week with what the Lord would have uh, me speak to Beacon Hill this morning about. Um, usually uh, when I'm able to fill a pulpit, it's because a pastor has said the church won't leave the walls, the church won't do uh, ministry, the church won't do this. Beacon Hill, you are getting that right. Amen. Amen. You, are, you are reaching your community with the gospel, and I thank God for that. Because it's people like you that reached me. Um, so I, I prayed and I, I sought God, and you know, one thing that is common uh, amongst God's people that are doing missional type ministry, and that's distraction. We can get distracted from the mission. We can get distracted from what God called us to do. And I, I, I want to speak on that this morning. I, if you've got a copy of God's Word, I want you to go to Acts chapter 14. Uh, I, I was not joking when I said we have all afternoon. Uh, um, I, I want to go through the whole chapter. It's 20-some verses, I believe. and um, I've got four distractions this morning that I think we can pull out of our text and we can learn from. Um, so let me pull it up. I simply entitled this morning, Distracted from the Mission. Beacon Hill, you've grown since the last time I was here, praise God. It's funny how you follow a blueprint that you find in the Bible about the church and how to do mission work and he grows his church. Y'all know in Acts 2, it said, that at the end of Acts 2, it says that God added to his church daily. I love that because if you go before he says that, it's simply, man, reaching people with the gospel, preaching the gospel, pulling all your resources together, right, and meeting needs of, of the people that you're around. And then he just simply somehow miraculously we follow that, he grows the church. It does not have to be some boxed up church model. Man, just preach the gospel and reach people. 
And then when you do that, you're going to face distractions. So first of all, I want to start this way. We are grateful to be here. The Fix is grateful to be here this morning with you guys. We are. We are. We feel like family. I want to start this way. There, there are some things that Christ says and claims about himself, right? And I, I want you to listen to this because the first thing I want to do really this morning is, is we want to edify the saints here, but I know that there are people sitting in these seats this morning that don't know Christ, that don't know the gospel. You may have wandered in here, right? Some of you may be seeking a meal. Some of you um, are just here, right? This is in the center of town. I don't know what brought you here this morning, but I can tell you that the sovereignty of God did. This is what Jesus says about himself. I am the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. Jesus alone can sustain us. All of us are starving beggars looking for food. Some of us are just beggars showing other beggars where to find it. I am the light of the world. Jesus is the original and eternal source of light in the universe. For us who are spiritually blind by birth. I am the gate of the, sh- gate of the sheepfold. Jesus is the only door to life for us who are lost outside of God's will. And see, I, I, that's why I love coming here. It's been a while. But see, many of you sitting in these seats that have received Christ as Lord, you are a miracle. You are a walking miracle. There are men and women in here who have been set free completely, right, by the gospel. You no longer have to chase the dope man. You no longer have to sit in that alley for hours waiting on that phone call. Many of you used to wake up 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning and would use the phone over and over again until the dope man would answer the phone whenever that would be. You no longer have to live that way. You have been set free from the bondage of sin. Some of you have not. That's why, that's why Fred, Fred gets stuck on a word, recovery. My sister uh, sang her testimony, and it was beautiful. And the one thing that stuck out to me and everything that she said and everything that she sung was, I have recovered. I've recovered. I'm no longer what I was. I'm new. I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm no longer what the world has classified me as. I'm not the drug addict. I'm not the alcoholic. I'm not the fornicator. I'm not the adulterer. I am a born-again believer in Christ. Jesus claims to be the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. Jesus knows and cares for us who are orphaned, wandering sheep without a shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the key to escaping spiritual death for us who are hopelessly doomed to death because of our sin. I am the true vine. Jesus is the source of eternal life for us who are dead and useless uh, branches apart from him. And then seven, this is one of my, this is one of my go-to passages. Like when I'm street preaching, uh, when I'm in other places, and, and, and somebody says, hey, Fred, would you preach? And I have nothing. I've got God's word here. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the acceptable path, the illuminating truth, and the giver of life for us who are lost, ignorant, and dead without him. Again, I mentioned John 14, 6. Here, uh, Jesus claims to be the truth. And when we stand on the truth, guys, when we stand on the truth, right, attacks, distraction will come. They will come. When you refuse to compromise the truth and the mission God has given you, Beacon Hill, expect distraction, expect persecution, expect roadblocks. I ask you this morning, Beacon Hill, do you know your mission as a church? 
Thank God I texted in the middle of the week and I got clarification of what your mission statement is. If you were asked, could you say it? Could you tell it? If someone walked into your church this morning and said, hey, what is the mission of this church? What would you say? To shine the light of Christ in dark places. And then I like uh, Pastor Mike's plumb line word. These are your plumb lines. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Everything speaks and everyone matters. People are the mission. That's beautiful. Is that not beautiful? So as a church, as you start to uh, come together, right? First under Christ and then under the mission of Beacon Hill, Expect distractions. Expect them. Jesus tells us that I, I, I didn't come to bring peace but a sword. That's a hard saying of Jesus. And then before we get into the main body of the text, I want to read you a, a, a text from Matthew chapter 10 very quickly. Matthew chapter 10, when you look at it, is important. Jesus uh, pulls out some disciples, right? He gives them this mission, and he sends them out. But he tells them something that is important for us all. He says, behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as a serpent and as innocent as a dove. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to the courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death. The father his child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all. And this is the part we got to remember. Because we do not wrestle with flesh and blood. It ain't you. Sometimes we take persecution and resistance and opposition and distractions and these things that go on in our day-to-day lives personal. They are not. They are not persecuting you. They are persecuting the Christ in you. They don't hate you. They hate Christ. Remember what he says in here. He says, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. See, when you start to live out the mission, church, you have been given, you are going to face things that are hard, persecution, rejection, and distraction. I want you to listen to what happens to Jesus when he sets his face to on completing the mission of dying for our sin. Listen to this. This, You find this in Luke 9. In verse 51 it starts, When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. This is important, guys, that we glean from this because once you first set your heart to follow Christ and the church sets sets its mission to complete what God has for us, Do you set your face towards what God has for you? Listen to 52. And he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But listen to this. This is wild. But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. He set his heart and his mind to complete what God's will for him was. People rejected him because he had set his face towards death. 
towards the cross, towards our eternal life. That was his mission. We have been given a mission. Stand on truth. Stand on the gospel. Go forth, right? We have a mission or a commission. Right, church? I, I like the word great commission because we are given many commissions in the scriptures. But here it's called the greatest commission. It is what the church is called to do. Beacon Hill, we have a mission. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all. All. What does all mean? All. All that I have commanded you. Right? I think sometimes in our church culture, we, we have like a, a buffet-style type of Christianity, a Sunday-type Christianity. Hey, come, let me entertain you for an hour. Let the worship, the worship last 55 minutes, and let me give you some sermonette to make you feel good about yourself as you go around the rest of your week. The pastor's job is not to coddle you, but to drive you to God. To drive you to the scriptures. It is. It is. It breaks my heart that people are worshiping worship and not God. Worship is good. Worship music is great. But this is everything, guys. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Do you hear that promise, church, this morning? Do what I've commanded you. Reach people with the gospel. Disciple them, teaching them all things that I've commanded you. And his promise is, I will be with you always to the end of the age. Take heart, little church, this morning. That God is good. And that his promises are real. Are you living your life on mission? This is good. I'm on page four. There's only seven. Are you living your life on mission or are you distracted? So what is a distraction? I love definitions. Are you ready? A thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else. Extreme agitation of the mind or emotions. That's funny that that can be a distraction. The definition of distraction is something that takes your attention away from something on which you should be focused. That's hard, right, for some of us. Especially me. My wife will tell you I'm ADHD. I I will go to move this here and I'll get distracted by the microphone. And before you know it, this never got done. Some uh, I, I like the Urban Dictionary, and I can't always use every definition in the Urban Dictionary. <laughs> but this one seemed to fit. And if you, if you understand the ministry that we're involved in, the men get distracted by girls within a month of getting clean. The girls do too. They put on some weight. They start smelling good. They start thinking rightly, and all of a sudden, they are chasing whatever walks by. So listen to the Urban Dictionary of uh, of the definition of distraction. A person of the opposite gender, which is not a significant other, but has enough beyond friendship feelings and possibilities attached to him or her that this person creates a major loss of productive time whenever he or she is available for contact. And really, I, really, guys, we, we lose more men and women in our discipleship process to, to relationship than we do drugs. It's, it's unbelievable. But anyway, guys, I think we can all agree that we live in a culture that is full of distraction. 
right? Right, my wife, she'll tell on me to anybody that asks. My phone is one of the biggest distractions that I have in my life. Facebook and, and social media and, and phone calls and texts and pictures and all, you name it. It's the whole gamut. That phone is a major distraction in my life. But social media, I got Facebook, Instagram. I'm too old for Instagram. I tried it. I don't know how to use it. Politics. We can get sidetracked with politics. As Christians, we can. We, we get so enthronged, right? Like anything you put before Christian is an idol, I believe. If I say, hey, I'm a conservative Christian. It's a distraction. You, you, your, your hope is in your conservatism, not your Christianity. Same, same with the other way, right? I, I'm not going to stand up here and claim to be anything, but on the Lord's side, where you find the Lord, that's where you'll find Fred. Does that make sense? But, but that goes beyond politics, guys. It goes beyond that. Right, if you're sitting here this morning, and I know, I don't know, I, see, this is where I lack. I, I, I can't relate sometimes, but... Like if you're sitting here thinking about some professional sport that's playing this afternoon and you're not focused in on the Word of God, you need to check your priorities and your, where you're at, right? If you, can't, if you can't sit here till 1245 when Fred finishes, then your priority's in the wrong spot. Seriously. But anything, I want you to think about it. That's just not with politics, but anything you put before Christian, you're in the wrong place. Netflix. Who in here likes to veg on Netflix? I'm guilty, guys. I'm guilty. When I should be faithful in the night watch, when I should be faithful in the middle of the night, when I should be up, God gets you up for certain reasons at certain times. Usually it's to pray and seek his face. I'm seeking Netflix. Other things like sin, right? Pornography, substance abuse, gossip. Any gossip in the church? Never. Division. Division. You know, recently I've been dealing with a situation, right? And I don't understand. This is where I love you, Beacon Hill. Because you're unified under reaching people outside of the walls of the church. I love that about you. But see, I, 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 have you, I, ooh, I, I, oh, I can't even get it out of my mouth. I got to be careful here. Do you know there are churches in our communities that get divided over doing ministry? It's unbelievable to me. Like somebody will come up with this, this great, great way to reach people in their community, and then you got half the church going, well, I don't know about that. I don't think we should be doing that. Right? Uh, man, drug addicted people in the church pews, I don't know about that. Right? What do you mean, homeless people? I mean, I got people that come to me and say, Fred, is it safe? Is it safe? Is it safe to go out and minister to homeless people? What are you talking about? You're just as homeless as they are. You are just as homeless as they are. And see, Christians don't realize that they are orphans too. They are homeless too. We are all homeless here on this planet. We are visiting this place. We're sojourners. I mean, what if God makes you homeless to reach homeless? It hurts me. It hurts me to see church churches bicker back and forth about reaching people. It hurts me. I don't understand it. Then we get caught up in title and position, right? And wanting to be heard. These are all distractions. They come in many forms. So again, when you commit to the mission, church, distractions will come. And the, the, this is important. You have to be so focused on the mission and loving the people. Listen, in the mission, right? The people you're serving alongside of. That nothing else gets your attention. Nothing else gets your attention. 
The Bible talks about perseverance, does it not? It actually talks about perseverance as a determiner of faith. Not some one-time decision or one-time prayer. You come to Christ, right? You follow through with baptism. What do you do after that? How do you live your life past that? Have you truly been born again this morning? Right? Because you are not going to be the same. You are not going to be drawn to the same things. You are, you are not going to be involved in the same things you were before. I, I will tell you one thing I know that changed in me instantly was my mouth. It was my mouth. That, that's one thing that I noticed right off, that, that the F-bomb was not leaving Fred's mouth every other sentence. Seriously. Like, you, you will be able to see the change, right? I, I tell people they will smell different. They will look different. You will have a glow about you. People will smell Christ on you. I got like, I, I even prayed over the scriptures yet. <laughs> Acts 14. Okay, Acts 14. We are going to look at four distractions. Four distractions. And really, I, I've, I've only got two pages left. Let's, let, let's pray really quick over the word. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you this morning. I, I thank you for the people that have gathered in this place. Uh, Lord, I just pray fervently, Lord God, that your words would go forth and not Fred's. Lord God, I pray that people would not remember Fred or the fix. Lord God, they would remember you. Lord, I pray that your people in this place would leave here different than when they walked in. And Lord, again, I pray through uh, your word that you would get glory this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, Acts 14, the first distraction is being a man pleaser and not a God pleaser. Okay, a man pleaser and not a God pleaser. So I want to read you the, uh, the, the, the first uh, verse of 14. It says, Now in Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogues and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. It's beautiful. So Paul, his team, are, are focused on the mission here. We can see that they are going, doing what God had called them to do. It's, it's funny how when God calls us to do something, others get in the way. Others get in the way and want to cause division. Look at two. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. It's an important scripture there. So when the gospel is preached and the mission is being advanced... I've got a side note here. I've always noticed that it's the ones who are not sold out. Listen, not sold out for Jesus or the mission that are always picking apart the ones that are. And this is important that you see this in this context because as Beacon Hill grows and continues to do what God's called them to do, you're going to have people that come in to the sheepfold that aren't sold out, that aren't all in, that, that claim Jesus but aren't, that don't show up to outreaches, that don't get involved in the missional work that Beacon Hill does. And you're going to find that those are the ones that are going to be on the outside of the circle talking about the ones and how they're doing everything wrong on the inside of the circle. I'm just telling you. Don't take my word for it. Just watch. Do you remember the scripture we read in the beginning? It said, be, um, be wise as a serpent and as harmless as a dove. Just watch. Keep your ears and your eyes open. You'll have people that claim things, but inwardly they're just stirring it up. It's the lukewarm ones who are always stirring up strife, backbiting, and gossiping about the ones that are living their life for Christ. 
See, when you stand on God's word, preach Christ and him crucified, people are going to come to Christ. That's the gospel, right? Romans 1.16, I, I have it written on the inside of my eyelids. I don't know if you know that or not. I've never told anybody that. This is my verse. This is the verse that God pressed upon my heart early in my walk, right? Do not be ashamed of the gospel. Because it's, it's the power of God and the salvation to all who believe. First the Jew and then the Gentile. I, I say to, well, I don't like to put people first and second, but to the junkie first and the alcoholic second. But that's just Fred, Fred's paraphrase. Same thing. But do you understand what I'm saying? And I don't know, y'all do street ministry, so I don't know if you know this, but even on the outside, you know, we had Jews and Gentiles. They didn't like each other, right? <laughs> but when you go downtown, when you do the ministry we do, like y'all do, alcoholics don't like heroin junkies. So they separate themselves, <laughs> right? And the alcoholics over here going, look at them junkies. They'll steal everything you got. And then the junkies sit over here and they'll say, look at them alcoholics. They can't even walk straight. <laughs> Seriously. It's funny that's in the human heart, ain't it? That's, that's in the heart. But see what the beautiful part of the gospel is, is when they really get the gospel, man, there ain't no more division. God brings the most unlikely people together. I'm just, it's just amazing to me. People are going to come to Christ. It, it's where God invested his salvetic power, his salvetic grace to bring us into right relationship with God through his son Jesus, the gospel. When you live your, li your life, right, out loud for mission, people are going to hate you for it, even other Christians. But I want you to look what Paul does here in 3. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. And I love that part because we get caught up. We, we live in a culture that wants signs and wonders, right? We want, we want miracles and we want to see God do this and we do that. And, and I think we get so hyper-focused on some of these things that we miss the real miracle. We, we miss people coming to Christ and being set free. That is the biggest miracle of all. That a man is dead in his trespasses, dead in his sin, right? And many, many of you in this room can understand what I mean. I, I shot dope for a better part of 15 years and I could not stop. I could not stop. I tried everything in my own power to stop. But the moment Christ got a hold of my heart, I never picked up another needle. Amen. So you might say, Fred, why, why are you so adamant about the gospel? Because it is the gospel that set Fred free. It wasn't some man laying his hands on me or knocking me over with the Holy Spirit. It was the indwelt gospel in my heart. And it was a faithful man of God that preached it. And it took root in here. And I was never the same. It was Christ that set me free. It was the gospel that set Fred free. I've got lots of notes. But the people of the city, listen, were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When the gospel is advanced, guys, when God's mission is advanced in the world, there will always be confrontation and division. Always. Remember, he said, I did not come to bring peace but a sword. This is why we have this weak type of Christianity in America. Because no one wants confrontation. We, we don't know how to confront each other. We run from it. We have a gospel that doesn't talk about sin or hell. No wrath and all love. God is a genie, right? And will give me whatever I want. 
And see, I don't know about you, but on the other side of the cross, my life got harder, not easier. It did. I have to go to the Word. I have to pour over the Scriptures. I have to pray. I have to conform Fred's will to what God's will is in my life. And I don't know about you. That's one of the hardest things we could ever do. Right? When our flesh acts up and we want to act out and we want to do this and we want to do that, I have to bring my feelings and my emotions and what Fred thinks under the authority of the Scripture. And that is hard, guys. I don't know about you, that's hard. But then you start serving people, right? And you start loving people. And people aren't easy, are they? You're right? I, I was, it's funny, you, you, don't make it, you don't call somebody back within five or six minutes, they're blasting you on Facebook now. I mean, seriously. Right? It happens. Then people talk about you. People ridicule you. People question every decision that you make. It's hard. And then you talk about like the physical aspect of doing this thing. Right? I think everybody, like, you know, we got healing ministries in every church now. And like, I don't know about you, but God don't want to heal everybody. Sometimes he lets us suffer for a reason. And it is usually for his glory. And like, I don't know about you, but Fred's this prideful and egotistical man. In the root of my heart, I am prideful. I am arrogant. And sometimes God humbles us in ways that we don't like. You know what I'm saying? And that's okay. Because God is making us more like his son. Sometimes he uses illnesses and other things to do that. I mean, I could, I, I could go into all kinds of stuff, man, my mind. Well, I, I tell you, you know, I, I have issues with some things, guys, and this is not the place to air those, but don't ever go to a healing ministry where the pastor um, can't cure himself. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, how does that work? You know what I'm saying? Like, come on, man. You are a false prophet, bro. And I don't mind saying it. Come on. I'm not saying God don't work miracles. God works miracles every day. If God wants to heal a man, he will. He will. Don't get me wrong. He will. I see it happen every day. I see God heal men and women every day. Because what the world calls a sickness is what we deal with. And if it's true, if, if addiction is a sickness, praise God for the Lord because he heals people that got that all day long. Man, I don't even know where I was, guys. This is why we have this weak Christianity in America. We talked about that. That's why we have prosperity preachers, right? I call them prosperity pimps and feel, feel good preachers who preach these motivational speeches and not the Word of God. And see, motivational speeches don't, speeches don't have the power to change a man's heart or a woman's heart. Only the gospel does. And I'll tell you why. And this is where I was getting at. They're more worried about what people think than what God says. They are man-pleasers and not God-pleasers. You know, God's mission would go so much further if we would worry more about pleasing God than man. And see, we get so, so wrapped up in some things, guys. And, and this morning, I had this beautiful time of prayer with your pastor, you know. And somebody prayed for revival. And I, I want revival. God, I pray for revival for the city of Richmond every day. Day. I pray for a revival in the men's and women's house. I pray for a revival in our little, little flock that we have. If we want revival, though, we have to sit under the word. We, we have to have the word bring us into this place of repentance. We, we have to have repentance, and we have to bear fruits worthy of that repentance. We have to be convicted of our sin. 
and our depravity that we may know the goodness of God. And see, once you've tasted and seen the goodness and the love of Christ, guys, revival will come. It will come. I believe this is one of the biggest distractions we face. See, but Paul here continues to advance the mission. Look at 5. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of Lycaonia, and to the surrounding country. And there, listen to seven. Look at seven. And there they continued to preach the gospel. They didn't stop. They didn't get scared. They didn't back up. They continued to do what God had called them to do. So things are heating up. This thing is really going to cost us, right? Here it's at the threat of death. And I don't know about you this morning. For a lot of us, this distraction would have completely taken us out of the game. Right? These people are getting ready to stone us. Look at eight. Now in Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking, and Paul looked intently at him and seeking that he had faith to be made well. Sit in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. Praise God. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices Saying in Laocinian, the gods, listen to this, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gate. And wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. So this second distraction is self-preservation, guys. This is important. And this is what I talked about before. Right? When things heat up and when people start to persecute us. We get more worried about self-preservation than anything. But here, listen, the third one. Is when things go well. When things go well. And right here, they preach the gospel. The people come running out. And call them a god. And that's important that you see that here. I think for most of us, we would accept that, right? You all come up after service and, Fred, you, you're like Zeus, man, right? I'm probably not going to rebuke you. Like, I'm going to be like, yeah, I'll take that, right? Things are going well for them. They're bringing out oxen. They're making sacrifices to these guys. They're calling them gods. We, we would build a platform around that. That's important that you see that. I think it's, it's interesting. I think most of us wouldn't argue that if somebody called us gods, we would just argue uh, back and forth about which one we are. You know what I'm saying? No, I, I, you're Zeus. I'm, I'm the other one. It's a platform. We don't want to offend these people. Let's just, let's just take what they've got, right? But look, look what Paul and them do, and, and this is important that you see this in 14. But when the apostles uh, Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, listen, men, why are you doing these things? 
We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains and from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness, even with words they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifices to them. They stay focused on the mission, guys. That's what I want you to see through this all. They did not veer from what God had called them to do. They tell them the truth. I want you to see that too. Even if it costs them their godship. And that brings us to our last point. And this is a half a page. The fourth distraction is failure. Failure. Third distraction is success. The fourth distraction is failure. Listen to 19, guys. But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. It's funny how you do the Lord's work, right? And you go for, may go from one place to another. And in that, people will follow you, right? And still talk about you. Listen. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Guys, this is not in my notes. Imagine that. It's funny how, how these guys were worship, worshiping them as gods, right? One minute. And the next minute, they're stoning them to death. The fickleness of men's hearts. They stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up. And entered the city. And on the next day, went on with Barnabas to Derby. When things go wrong, we want to quit, don't we? And then, this kind of speaks into that thing before. Uh, nothing angers people like destroying their idols. And confronting their idols. And, and if any of you in here um, are discipling someone else or... Um, helping disciple others. You're going to get hurt. You're going to get hurt. And that's okay. That's okay because you have to speak what God laid on your heart to speak. And you have to put your finger in places they don't want it. You're going to have to touch things in them that they don't want you to touch. And that's okay. Because that's part of the discipleship process. You may have a hard time with someone in a discipleship situation. And they may get mad and they may get angry at you. They're going to blast you all over Facebook and send you nasty emails. But I've found that 99% of the time, time has a way of bringing somebody back around. And they might get a year down the road two years down the road, and they may look back at what you said and say, that was from God and I needed to hear it. And that's going to send them all the way back around. And how do I know this? Because I had men of God in my life that said things to me that I could not stand and I did not agree with. And I got mad and upset and I refused to talk to them. And I walk away, right? But a year or two or even four, it comes back around. And you know what I have to do? I have to go back and apologize. Because I believe that's what the Holy Spirit would want us all to do. If a man speaks truth into you and five years down the road you see it, you got to go back and tell him. But what I want you to see here, the, the same people who were hauling Paul and Barnabas, hailing Paul and Barnabas as gods or, and offering them sacrifices were the ones who ended up stoning them. They drag him out, stone him, and leave him for dead. 
Paul and Barnabas could have quit here. But really, the biggest part of this is, is amazing. The Scripture tells us that he gets up and goes back into the same city that stoned him. <laughs> these guys look past all these distractions, and listen, this is where I'll end. And if the worship team wants to come up. Um, look at 21. When they had preached the gospel to the city, that city, and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. When you stay faithful to the mission, church, and you continue to advance the gospel against opposition and distraction, I want you to know that the church grows. Things happen and they're good. The gospel, the mission of God for the church is advanced here at the end of the chapter. Beacon Hill, thank you. The altar will be open. Um, I know uh, in a room this size, there are men and women in here that don't have a relationship with Jesus. I pray today would be that day. I pray fervently, Lord God, that you would fill that baptismal before we leave. That there's someone in here that wants to get wet. He wants to follow through in obedience to the call. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. I thank you for this time and this place. I thank you for Beacon Hill. I thank you for the opportunity to share your word. Uh, Lord, thank you for allowing me to run over uh, and these people to have grace. Uh, Lord, and I pray that in everything and in all things you would get glory and that your word would have changed just one person's heart. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.